If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome to the New Chemist Podcast. We're so glad you're listening. Feel free to download this podcast on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Here on the New Chemist, we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as careers, community research, and COVID-19. We're happy you're tuning in. My guest today is someone from the past, so we're going to be looking at the past work of Dr. Paul Boyer, the Nobel Prize Laureate in Chemistry in the year 1997. So the rationale for this, it is possible to start the journey to understanding the great feats and triumphs of scientists in the past and present. Be determined and consistent, keep at it, be hopeful, unrealistic, persevere. So this is a continuation of the Think Tank series. Um, we're looking, we'll be looking at different speeches of Nobel Prize laureates in chemistry and other places as well, other areas as well rather. And the analysis for today is Paul Boyer's Nobel Prize lecture. That's a text we're going to analyze. So for the video, for those who will see the video that will be uh, corresponding with this audio version in the podcast, there's a picture of Paul Boyer receiving his Nobel Prize. Before Paul Boyer received his Nobel Prize, there was a speech by Professor Bertel Anderson of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. The speech was given and he gave the story in a brief summary the rationale for the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. So fast facts about Dr. Paul Boyer. He lost his mother just weeks after his 15th birthday. He noted how he went to um, Brigham Young University, then to University of Wisconsin-Madison for graduate school. He received several awards and won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. It's important to note that he also read the Book of Knowledge, which is an encyclopedia aimed at juveniles, first published in 1912 by the Groyler Society, and he also read the Harvard Classics, which is a very interesting book series that I'm going to embark on reading. The Harvard Classics, uh, originally known as Dr. Eliot's Five Foot Shelf, is a 51 volume anthology of classic works from world literature, compiled and edited by Harvard University's president, Charles W. Eliot, and first published in 1909. A short list of some of volume one, just volume one, the other volumes within the Harvard Classic series involve works by Benjamin Franklin, John Woolman, William Penn, so the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, the journal of John Woolman, Fruits of Solitude by William Penn. It also involves other, other seminal works, such as the Confessions by St. Augustine and The Wealth of Nations by Am Smith. Definitely a series worth reading. Um, now, this is how I would analyze a Nobel Prize laureate speech after the second time or third time reading it. And this is my perspective as a graduate student in chemical biology. So before we start, let's just keep in mind it's possible. It's possible to read these things and to try and understand them with guidance and some research. So just a preamble on ATP synthase. So in order to understand ATP synthase, we need to understand that ATP synthase is a part of the electron transport chain. Um, the electron transport chain is organized in a particular way. It's established now that the electron transport chain is organized in which you have a respiratory super complex, which consists of complex one, three, and four. Um, it goes from one to three or two to three in terms of the flow of uh, electrons um, throughout the complex. But in, without getting into the nitty gritty details, let's just focus on ATP synthase, which is complex five, and it's a complex of the ETC, as I said. ATP synthase is significant since it facilitates the production of ATP. Now, an overarching trend that goes along with the chemiasmatic hypothesis 
which is which coincides with Mitchell's idea, who was a 1978 Nobel Prize laureate in chemistry. The exergonic flow of electrons fuels the endergonic pumping of protons. So some big ideas to keep in mind. Um, within this work or this lecture, he discusses that the enzyme uses a novel mechanism that has catalytic steps different from any that has been seen before with other enzymes. ATP synthase has three copies of a large alpha and beta subunit with three catalytic sites located mostly on the beta subunit at the interface of the alpha and beta subunits. So these are subunits of this enzyme complex. So remember, we're talking about high level structure, not really linear or, or primary or secondary structure, we're talking about high level structure. And it's also important to keep in mind that oxidative phosphorylation, um, it's an oxidative process, of course, it is biochemically significant because it produces a substantial amount of ATP. ATP is important since it's a common energy currency in the human body that in many cases is coupled to thermodynamically unfavorable processes so that they can work or run more efficiently. So in this talk, we will talk about why should we care, what well, the three points that stand out to me as a chemi chemical biology graduate student, and what are the implications. So let's begin. Um, so let's narrow in, narrow in some more. We're looking at the mitochondria, which is a very significant organelle. We could talk about the mitochondria in terms of distribution, in which you have heteroplasmy or homoplasmy, in which you have different distributions or same distributions of DNA. Homoplasmy, same, hetero, different. Um, we could also talk about the mitochondria and its intricacies, in which you have significant phospholipids that make up the inner membrane, such as cardiolipid. We could talk about the mitoribosomes. We could talk about the crystalline membrane. We could talk about the power of the mitochondria and that the DNA of mitochondria is normally maternally inherited. We could also talk about mitochondrial diseases. But today, we're talking about ATP, ATP synthase. So ATP synthase, um, let's dive into Dr. Paul Boyer's lecture. Um, he spoke about how it's a key player in the processes um, ATP is a key player in the processes, and the abbreviation for ATP, abbreviation of ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So adenosine triphosphate, if we break it down, it is made up of the adenine base, which is a double ring um, functionality, and it's bonded to the ribose sugar, or the oxyribose sugar, and then you also have the phosphate. So it has adenosine triphosphate has three phosphates. So he then he goes on to discuss how when he was a graduate student, Fritz Lippmann, big name, recognized the broad role ATP played in biological energy capture and use. The adenosine portion for our purposes can be regarded, as Paul Boyer speaking, can be regarded as a convenient handle to bind the ATP to enzymes. It has three phosphate groups attached in a row, particularly the last two that participate in energy capture. And we normally see that as the pyrophosphate. When the energy stored in ATP is used, the terminal and hydride bond is split, forming adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate. The resynthesis of ATP coupled to energy input, this is a key idea, is catalyzed by an enzyme called ATP synthase, present in abundance in intracellular membranes of animal mitochondria, such as humans, such as in humans, plant, chloroplasts, bacteria, and other organisms. So these are good ideas to keep in mind. The ATP made by your ATP synthase is transported out of the mitochondria and used for the function of muscles, brains, and other tissues and organs. Um, the ATP, ADP and phosphate formed when ATP is used um, is returned to the mitochondria and ATP is made again using the energy from oxidations. So let's continue on. Um, so this process is ubiquitous uh, for the most part. Um, all living cells contain hundreds of large specialized protein molecules called enzymes. So enzymes are globular proteins. Enzymes are very important in the body. They help to catalyze thermodynamically unfavorable processes. They serve as biological catalysts in which they reduce the E of A or the activation energy or provide an alternative pathway um, for the reaction to occur. Um, enzymes are very important in the body whether it be in processes such as respiration, digestion, a lot of biological processes are run with the machinery of which you consider to be enzymes. 
and catalyze hundreds of reactions. So the important and very difficult question that remained unanswered, and Paul Boyer spoke of this for many years, was how the ATP synthase uses the proton motor force to make ATP. Um, so as he was speaking, he, sp he mentioned how um, ATP, during net ATP synthase, synthesis, the three catalytic sites in the enzyme acting in sequence first bind ADP and phosphate, then undergo a conformational change so as to make a tightly bound ATP, and then change conformation again to release this ATP. Let's keep reading. These changes are accomplished by a striking rotational catalysis. I'm going to talk more about that in a later episode. Driven by a rotating inner core of the enzyme. So this is coinciding with the ideas that we consider now in which ATP synthesis is considered to be a molecular motor or a pump, um, which in turn is driven by the protons crossing the mitochondrial membrane. Um, you know, he mentioned how these unusual features are energy linked binding changes that include release of a tightly bound ATP, sequential conformational changes of three catalytic sites to accomplish these binding changes and a rotary mechanism that drives the conformational changes. These features had not been recognized previously in enzymology. That's something similar. I would say so myself. Um, here we have a picture of the uh, layout of ATP synthase. So let's take it back a bit. In the mid-1950s, um, some 12 years after Paul Boyer received his PhD, um, some experiments on how ATP is made were conducted in his laboratory. Um, one concerned the capture of energy in glycolysis, which we know is an anaerobic, typically an anaerobic process, in which you have a, a small amount of ATP that's made. Um, glycolysis typically takes place in the cytoplasm of the cells. Glycolysis is important. Um, we go from glucose to pyruvate, passing through a variety of enzymes. So from, let's just go through glycolysis quickly. Glycolysis in which you have glucose, so the use of hexokinase is converted to G6P or glucose 6-phosphate. Um, using phosphoglucose isomerase, we go from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. Using phosphofructokinase, we go from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Using aldolase, aldolase spits out um, DHAP, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and G3P. Using triose phosphate isomerase, we interconvert um, DHAP to G3P. Using GAP DH or glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase, we convert G3P to 13 BPG or 13 bisphosphoglycerate. Using phosphoglycerate kinase, we produce 3 phosphoglycerate. Using phosphoglucomutase, we produce 2 phosphoglycerate. Using enolase, which proceeds through an E1CB mechanism, we produce PEP or phosphoenol pyruvate. And using pyruvate kinase, we produce pyruvate. Pyruvate kinase then shuttles or then goes through um, pyruvate dehydrogenase to produce acetyl-CoA and that feeds into the TTA cycle in which you have oxaloacetate combining with acetyl-CoA to form citrate to the enzyme citrate synthase. So that's just a recap of glycolysis and significance in aerobic respiration. So we found that going back to the lecture, we found that the oxidation of glyceraldehyde through phosphate to occur without the participation of inorganic phosphate. This is him noting this, suggesting participation of an acyl enzyme intermediate. Extension of these experiments and salient findings in the Raqqa group, again, we have a big name, demonstrated that a sulfahydryl or sulfahydryl group on the enzyme was acylated and the acyl enzyme was cleaved by inorganic phosphate to form 1,3-diphosphoglycerate which in turn transferred a phosphoryl group to ADP to make ATP. Key idea, take note of this. The demonstration that two covalent intermediates, the acyl enzyme and the phosphorylated substrate preceded ATP formation made it seem logical to seek for similar intermediates in oxidative phosphorylation. So established conceptual precedent led to further investigation. That's what this is saying. And as we and others learned years later, this was not a useful approach. He said, so of more relevance to ATP synthase were experiments in which you had the isotope of oxygen, 18 oxygen, and 32 phosphate. Um, 
those of the radioactive strips initiated because of the demonstration by Mildred Kahn that mitochondria would catalyze a rapid exchange of phosphate oxygens with those of water, phosphate and oxygen with those of water. So we found that the phosphate experiments um, were using the overall reaction of oxidative phosphorylation was dynamically reversible, which makes sense. Um, with some 16 years later, that we found that the simple explanation that no intermediate was formed and that rapid exchange resulted from the rapid and reversible formation of a tightly bound ATP. So moving along, let's talk about the catalytic sites. Um, Dr. Boyer further went on to say in his lecture that chemical derivatization studies such as those in Bragg's laboratory, again, we have a big name, and summarizing in his reviews that he referenced, showed that all three 13 subunits although with identical amino acid sequence, had distinctly different chemical properties. That is something to take note of. We were also impressed by the studies. They were also impressed by the studies of Fitte's laboratory showing that one defective mutant 13 subunits stopped catalysis. And by related mutational studies in Senior's laboratory that favored the participation of three equivalent 13 subunits for catalysis. So, the conclusion that you reach is very likely is that it's very likely that three sites participate in an equivalent manner. Subsequent events have strengthened this conclusion, um, although he said that some doubts remain of which he was not aware of at the time. The probability that three sites participate equivalently has guided experiments in his laboratory since the presence of three 13 subunits first seem likely. So he also spoke about the rotational catalysis within this enzyme. Um, some ideas to mention is that there were related experiments that took place in this laboratory with sodium potassium ATP synthase. Um, that's something to note. So what three points stood out or stand out to me? The intricacies of ATP synthase. The idea that all living cells contain enzymes, and these enzymes are very important, especially in biological reactions. And also, um, or finally, oxidative phosphorylation is important. Additionally, with ATP synthase um, and how it proceeds with its mechanism of catalyzing the formation of ATP. So what are some implications? When it comes to disease etiology, whether it be Alzheimer's, neuro neurodegenerative diseases, or other diseases that can be uh, attributed to mitochondrial dysfunction or mitochondrial disease, or whatever the case may be, and of course, that's to the bioenergetic paradigm. Um, whatever the case may be, ATP synthase is very important because it produces a key energy currency in the body that is used and is coupled to a lot of reaction. So it pays to understand these things. So I told you what why we should care. It's an important enzyme in biological reactions. What three points is to me? The structure of the enzyme, the intricacies of it, um, the fact that enzymes are very important in biological reactions and also oxidative phosphorylation, which is catalyzed, or which involves ATP synthase, is a very important process. And what are the implications? The implications for disease etiology, disease, or, or looking at the origins of diseases. So here we have it. Paul Boyer's lecture, a summary in the eyes of a chemical biology graduate student at this time. Hopefully it helps. So... If I was to address this, or if I was categorizing it or breaking it down for kids, for example, um, ADP synthase is important. This enzyme or this machine or this protein is important because it produces or helps it to form or facilitate the formation of a key energy currency or a key molecule that is important in the body. So that's for the kid. For high school student, this is important because it's associated with something that we learned about known as respiration. Respiration involves how the body is able to produce energy from food. So for the graduate student, the lecture is important. It produces seminal ideas or it introduces seminal ideas that are helping us to this day and informing our work. So thanks again for listening. So once you have it, this again, you have it. This is the New Chemist podcast um, in which we discuss uh, chemistry, which simply put is a science of change.
and we also discuss ideas such as research, careers, COVID-19, and a variety of other ideas within the realm of science. We've had guests. This is within the Think Tank series, of course. We reference the work of Dr. Paul Boyer, the lecturer, which is, on, which is publicly available on the Nobel uh, Foundation's website. And also we reference a book that outlined the lecture and speech, the introductory speech by the Dr. Bertel Anderson. So, Professor Bertel. So thanks again for listening. Hopefully this benefited you. Hopefully it helped. Stay tuned. This is just a preamble to more that will come. Also stay tuned because this upcoming week and the weeks to come, we will have interviews by Dev Mandavia, interviews with Dev Mandavia, um, Julio Rodriguez and Janae Burroughs, who are all leaders in their own age and stage and right. So thanks again for listening. Just to note, the views in this podcast reflect those of myself and my guests. Thanks for listening. We're glad you were able to tune into this podcast. Once again, this is The New Chemist, where we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as the other sciences, careers, community, research, and COVID-19. Thanks again for listening. Note, the views on this podcast represent those of my guests and I. Thank you.